A summary of this video can be found linked in the description down below. Chapter 1. The Client You are an alien, but you're also a user. One day, as usual, you log onto your computer to access the modern marvel we call the internet. You open up a browser, perhaps Chrome, Firefox, or another, and type in a web address, maybe to your favorite YouTube channel. This is the moment where you become a user. You are a user who uses things, and your browser is referred to as the client. More generally speaking, the client is any medium through which you interact with the internet. A video game, for example, would also be an acceptable client. And finally, the Small James YouTube channel or any other website that loads up in your browser is called the front end. The front end is simply the visible and tangible interface the user can interact with. So in summary, you are a user the browser, e.g. Firefox, through which you access the internet is called the client, and the websites you see are the front end. Chapter 2. The Network So now we understand a bit about the client, and this lets us introduce another concept called client side. When code is run or actions are performed in your browser or on your device, they are done in an environment accessible to the user. These operations are referred to as client side. Many websites run JavaScript in the background to load properly, and as this code is run in your browser on the client, they are client side. But now, the question arises. If we have a client side, then what is on the other side? Or sides? And also, where are these sides, and how do they communicate? Great questions, I'm glad you asked. To answer your questions, first we need to learn about the internet. You might think of the internet as the ability to go to websites, communicate online, play video games with others, watch YouTube, and save stuff to the cloud. And if that's the case, then you're already halfway to the complete answer. This doesn't actually explain what it is that you're connecting to, however. When your computer or your device connects to the Wi-Fi, or your phone has 3G, 4G, 5G access, what is that exactly? Well, at its core, both of these are what we call networks. A network is a web of encrypted signals transmitted either through cables or as electromagnetic waves in the air. And once authenticated, devices can interpret these signals. Some signals come from Wi-Fi routers, others from local cell towers. Eventually, nearly all signals connect to a global network of fiber optic cables called the backhaul. And this network is what carries encrypted data all around the world. Or in the case of aliens, extraterrestrially. Thus, the internet is a global network connecting computers, devices, and hardware to enable information exchange and access to countless services. So now that we're connected, and the user interacts with the network via a client or browser, we can dive into the original question. What happens when we type in a URL and press enter? Type in a URL? What on earth is a URL? A URL, or Uniform Resource Locator, is a web-friendly address that helps locate something, just like a physical address. At a high level, we can imagine that a URL locates a website potentially but in truth, it's actually slightly more complicated. To begin, let's break down the anatomy of what we know as a URL. First, we have the domain, and this is the most recognizable part. For example, google.com, hire.sh, smalljames.com, youtube.com. These are all domains. Then we have a protocol, HTTP or HTTPS. Not really going to dive into that, but you've probably seen them around. We also have the subdomain, which is the www. or potentially store. or blog. or shop. There's lots of different examples. And then we have an optional parameter called a port. The default for most of the experiences that you have on the internet is port 443. Some other examples are 83,51173, and this is an optional parameter. 
We also have what's known as the path. For example, you could have slash login or slash dashboard or slash home or slash product or slash auth slash dashboard. These are separate paths within the domain. And as an addition, we can also have queries. These are distinguished by the use of the question mark and then the name of the query parameter and the associated value. For example, page is equal to four. And finally, we have what is known as the fragment or section that's typically denoted with a hash or pound key and then an ID or identifier for that fragment or section. And when we smoosh all of these together, we end up with what is known as the URL. Now, the most important part of the URL is arguably the domain. And every domain is paired with what is known as an IP address. An IP address is an internet protocol address, which is just a series of numbers that is challenging to remember, which is why the common URL exists. They're much more human friendly. We use what is known as the DNS or domain naming service to pair domains with an IP address. The domains allow us to gain access to these IP addresses where the series of numbers is the metaphysical address of the device. Every device connected to the internet has an IP address. Not all of them are linked to a URL and the IP address of a device may change with the location of your device or the manner in which it is connected to the internet. Moral of the story, every device has an IP address which locates that device. So now we know that every device has a location. Why do the devices need locations? The answer to that question lies within what is known as a network request. So when you type in a URL into your browser and hit enter, you're actually entering a semi-physical address tied to another device. So how then does this result in a website appearing in your browser? That is another excellent question. Upon pressing enter, your device, the client, sends out a signal called a network request. This request is encrypted with information defining its nature and intent and it leaves behind your computer to be launched into the realm of the internet as it enters the network. The request typically includes an address. These are the IP address that specify the destination of the request. They also typically have a verb or method. This is the action of the request. Get requests are to get information or retrieve data. Post requests are to send data. Put requests are to update or overwrite data. Delete requests are to remove data. And these are all the action verbs associated with different types of network requests. And another common parameter specified within these requests is the path or route. And just as an address locates a home, the path is the room within the home, providing further specificity as to where this request needs to go. There are potentially many other parameters and attributes that can define a request. These are just some of the most common. And with this IP address, the network request begins its journey through the network to its destination, where it will eventually encounter hardware and software that we refer to as a server. So to summarize chapter two, the network, when you hit enter on that URL, your browser, which doesn't immediately have access to the information needed to load the website, you don't have every website loaded on your computer. And so instead, we have to send out requests to the ethos, to the network, asking for that information. And the destinations of these requests are defined within the IP addresses, and they locate different pieces of hardware and software known as a server. Chapter three, servers. You are the user. You interact with the internet through a client or browser, which, when connected, allows you to send requests to the network called network requests. These requests are sent into the internet with an address that locates a specific destination. And that, from a technical standpoint, is exactly what happens when you hit enter on that URL. When we reach this destination, we encounter hardware, 
running software known as a server. This probably isn't what you expect to hear when your standard experience is simply seeing a website loading on your screen, but we will get there. The network to which these requests are sent is cleverly set up so that IP addresses flexibly locate a device and direct requests right to their destination. Once the request arrives, a functional server connected to the internet and set up to listen to incoming requests to its IP address can decrypt the request and execute code to determine exactly what the request intends. If you've typed a URL into your browser, the request is typically to get information. Specifically, the HTML code that your browser can then interpret to display a website and provide the user an interface or front-end experience. The server registers the intent of your request, gathers the HTML code that it knows you want, and it sends it back over the network across the internet to the address of origin specified as a property or header of the network request. In simpler terms, a return to sender. In such a case, the server has literally served up a website and when your browser receives the response from the server containing the HTML code, it can then display it on the screen. All of this happens in the time it takes to load a standard website, which is astonishingly quick. So to summarize chapter three, which is a server, when you hit enter on that URL, your browser emits a network request that is intended for a specific address within the network. That destination is tied to a server, which is some hardware running some software. Listening to these incoming requests, it receives your request, interprets what it is that you want, and it responds accordingly. Now we've already talked about the front end, but there is another construct known as the back end. When we think of servers and what they serve up to the client, to the browser, we're also talking about something called the back end. The back end is the server side of a web application, the complement to the client side, which together as yin and yang create the full stack. The backend includes the software, logic, and database interactions that run behind the scenes to process user requests and deliver the appropriate responses. If the front end is what the user sees and interacts with, the back end is everything else that happens behind the closed doors, the magic to make the front end functional. This includes examples such as database management, which is storing and retrieving data like user profiles or posts on a social network. It could also be business logic, rules and workflows that define how data should be handled or processed. For instance, calculating prices or managing permissions based on user roles. It could also be authentication and authorization ensuring that only authorized users can access certain information or perform certain actions. And a final example is server communication, receiving requests from the front end, processing them and sending the relevant responses back. In essence, the back end powers the front end and together they harmoniously create a complete application. Without the back end, the front end would be static, a limited interface. The back end brings it to life by allowing a user to access it and interact with dynamic data and resources. Now, there are many different types of servers, all running different back end applications. In my home, I run a Raspberry Pi device that is connected to the internet and listening for incoming requests to its IP address that I have enabled it to receive. This is a server. Google owns facilities full of hardware running code that is set up to listen for incoming requests and then distributes processing efforts across a massive interconnected system of servers, which are essentially more machines running code. These are servers. Serverless cloud infrastructure is simply additional hardware running more software, making it, in essence, just another server listening for incoming requests from the network. Many servers exist solely to send HTML code back to users interacting with the network via a client or browser, and others perform far more complex functionalities. In essence, the internet is simply clients and servers 
connected and communicating through network requests between addresses within a network. Now the plot thickens when you realize that seven different services can be deployed on hardware all around the globe, working together synchronously via another server that coordinates all incoming network requests to achieve a single outcome, a website loading on your screen. This is called systems architecture. We design intricate systems of hardware running software that work harmoniously to deliver a service across the internet. And finally, we come across the concept known as the full stack. Now you have a website loaded on your device within a browser referred to as the front end. This front end provides you with an easier interface for interacting with the internet and ultimately billions of servers around the world all connected to the internet and listening for incoming requests across a network. These servers are listening for these incoming requests and they respond to them appropriately. And as the user, you receive and experience the information or service provided in the response. You click a save button, sign in, create a new account, select a link, reload a page, send a friend request or share an experience in a video game. These are all full stack interactions that happen over and over and over again between the client side and the server side, between front end and back end. Clients and servers interact via network requests connected across the internet and you, the user, get to enjoy that experience.